Good afternoon, Dr. Norton here with Nathaniel Hawthorne. I'll have to excuse my voice, I've just come down with a bit of a <clears throat> cold this week. Some sniffles. It's very, very annoying. Well, I'm excited to get into some Nat Nathan. Wow, testing. Some Nathaniel Hawthorne. And Nathaniel Hawthorne is a great writer. Some great novels, you're probably familiar with The Scarlet Letter. <clears throat> also, another great text um, for some extra time this summer, if you feel so inclined is um, <clears throat> The House of the Seven Gables, another great a great work that um, really captures a lot of what Nathaniel Hawthorne was passionate about. But these short stories are, are fantastic, and there's quite a bit of, of Nathaniel Hawthorne within each of them as well. And so hopefully we'll be able to pull some of that out, to draw some of that out um, of these texts. So for today, we've got my kinsman, Major Molino. Um, we have uh, Young Goodman Brown, and we have the Minister's Black Veil. So, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1804 to 1864. I mentioned before his two most well-known works, Scarlet Letter, 1850, and The House of the Seven Gables, 1851. Those are two good years for Nathaniel Hawthorne. You know, something, a little side note, um, I, had, I heard a while back, or I read a while back, that um, Hawthorne's wife didn't like the Scarlet Letter. It was just so depressing, she thought, she thought. And he wanted she wanted him to write something more um, upbeat and positive. And so he wrote The House of the Seven Gables. Uh, some, no, extra char- no extra charge for that. 1804. Nathaniel Hawthorne, born in Salem, Massachusetts. His father, Nathaniel Hawthorne, another Nathaniel, um, was a sea captain and descendant of John Hathorne. Now, the only reason I say that is because John Hathorne was one of the... One of the um, judges in the Salem Witchcraft Trials of 1692. And uh, the Salem Witchcraft Trials, in in some symbolic and literal ways, uh, find their way into Hawthorne's works. He is deeply troubled by corrupted religion. He's deeply troubled by stiff, hardened Puritanism in a very religious sense. The religious oppression that's found in in Puritanism, at least as he expresses it, and also the idea of the mob, mob mentality. You see it's all through Nathaniel Hawthorne's works, this this, the problem with the mob mentality, and part of what he blames um, the Salem Witchcraft Trials for is this mob mentality. All right, so um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's dad died when he was only four years old, when Nathaniel was only four years old. Um, After this, Nathaniel Hawthorne's wife, or sorry, his mother, withdrew to a, into a life of seclusion, which she maintained until her death. From Salem, the family moved to Maine, where Hawthorne was educated at Bowdoin or Bowdoin College, 1821-1824. One cool thing about this is that he, his college buddies, uh, among his college buddies were very famous poet uh, Longfellow and Franklin Pierce, who became the 14th president of the United States. Some key themes. First one in Hawthorne's work, alienation. Now these are going to be key as you, as you read to be, think about where you see alienation, for instance, in, in the short stories. A character is in a state of isolation because of self-cause or societal cause or a combination of both. Uh, right off the bat, I'm just thinking of uh, Robin from my, my kinsman, Major Molino. We have this sense of self-alienation. Alienation. He leaves his parents' place and he goes into the city. He alienates himself from family to find a kinsman. And we'll talk about what he's actually looking for, but I think in truth he's looking for freedom. Um, and so alienation kind of takes on the role or takes on a, like a characteristic of freedom, of detachment from authority figure toward independence. Um, Goodman Brown, you know, does he go into the woods for alienation? Um, that's a good question. I'm j- just spitballing right now, actually. I don't, I don't think that's really going to work, but that could be. And then, um, what about uh, Minister's Black Veil? There is something interesting about the Minister's Black Veil and the, and the way the veil contributes to a sense of alienation. I like that. That's kind of cool. Second one, initiation. It involves the attempts of an alienated character to get rid of his isolated condition. The attempts of an alienated character to get rid of his isolated condition through initiation. So what initiation rites do you see in these three texts? My kinsman, Major Molino, goes through a major initiation rite in the city that he goes into. 
right? He, he, he realizes that, that people do not want to extend him all the courtesies he thinks he deserves. He also discovers that there's a pretty intense rivalry between the colonists and the British, the haves and the have-nots, perhaps even um, people of high social class and people of lower social class. class. And so his initiation is a coming of age, I suppose in some ways, into the ways of the world. Problem of guilt, number three. A character's sense of guilt forced by the puritanical heritage or by society. It can also be guilt versus innocence or problem of guilt uh, forced by the puritanical heritage. Where do you see guilt in these texts? Well, clearly that's a huge part of, of, of Goodman Brown um, and Minister's Black Veil. Um, both of which seem to, to, to try to um, eradicate this idea of false guilt, um, not in a sense of, of, of liberty, but for a sense of reality, uh, coming to the point where we realize that everyone is sinful, everyone is broken. And you see that in both texts. Goodman Brown can't handle it. He seems more of a traditional Puritan, right? Um, he can't handle seeing all this sin. He thinks, no, 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 people should be right and good and true and, and noble, the minister's black veil, the minister there, Hooper, seems very um, uh, balanced. He seems very, um, he seems okay with the fact that, that sin is everywhere. I think that's why he smiles at three or four different key times in that short story. A smile comes across his face, not in mockery, but perhaps a smile of knowing that this is the way it is. And, and no matter how much you people try to ignore it or cover it up, it's here, and it's part of our lives, sin. And so this idea of the guilt, the problem of guilt in both Goodman Brown and uh, Minister's Black Veil. My kinsman Major Molino, I don't really see it there too much. Uh, pride is the fourth one, fourth. So you got alienation, initiation, problem of guilt, pride. Hawthorne treats pride as an evil. Most of his villains are full of pride, and we do see that in, in Goodman Brown. Goodman Brown is kind of a strange hero, isn't he? He's kind of a hero villain almost. He's kind of a broken hero, broken protagonist with all kinds of baggage that he takes to his death with him. Um, I think an interesting connection between Goodman Brown and Hooper is a cool contrast. Goodman Brown being f so full of the anxiety of, of his self-righteousness, uh, Hooper literally just covering his face and saying, this is, this is all men's sin right here in front of our faces. And we try to deny it, we try to cover it up, but it's hypocrisy. In our hypocrisy, we, we cover up what is true and, and real. Um, pride in Major Molino? Well, I mean, I suppose what you see there is Major Molino is brought down perhaps because of his pride. We don't have a whole lot of that backstory there. We'll get into that one in a minute. I'm not sure that really relates to this one. Um, I suppose my, I wrote in my notes here physical pride in Robin uh, yeah, her, um, pride in his heritage pride in his, in his kinsmen spiritual pride in Goodman Brown I think I could see that too and then the fifth one fifth uh, Puritan New England is used as a background and a setting in many of Nathaniel Hawthorne's tales some influences on Hawthorne <clears throat> Salem, Massachusetts was a key influence on his early childhood. As I said before, his family's involvement in the Salem witch trials. The second one, the Puritan community, is a major influence on Hawthorne. One of his fa forefathers, like I mentioned, was a, was a leading Puritan in the, in the Salem witch trials. Number three, the existence of the devil. And of evil. Uh, real evil. Number four, belief in determinism. This is the general philosophical thesis that states that for everything that happens... There are conditions such that, given them, nothing else could happen. So where do you see determinism in these tales? One last note before we jump into these texts is this period of American literature is called the American Renaissance. In American literature, the American Renaissance um, was a period during which many of the literary, literary works most widely considered American masterpieces were produced. This period is generally defined as the mid-19th century, but especially the years roughly from 1850 to 1855. Major works from those years include um, 
many of Ralph Waldo Emerson's great works. Uh, I mentioned before the Scarlet Letter and House of the Seven Gables. You have Herman Melville's Moby Dick, 1851. Uh, Thoreau wrote Walden in 1854. And Walt Whitman's um, first edition of Leaves of Grass came out in 1855. Those five years, pretty stinking good. So that's considered the American literary renaissance, the American renaissance, 1850 to 1855, typically, right there, mid-19th century. All right, so let's, get, let's jump in here. My kinsman, Major Molino, on the opening, opening paragraph, I think it says a lot here. After the kings of Great Britain had assumed the right of appointing the colonial governors, the measures of the latter seldom met with the ready and general approbation which had been paid to those of their predecessors. Under the original charters, the people looked with most jealous scrutiny to the exercise of power, which did not emanate from themselves, and they usually rewarded the rulers with slender gratitude for the compliances by which, in softening their instructions from beyond the sea, they had incurred the reprehension of those who gave them. That's some big language. I mean, it's amazing how... Um, yeah, that's, that's a bit... Uh, not easy really to understand. But basically what he's saying is, in very official terms, I think his tone takes on a very official uh, nature, um, saying basically the, the colonists, the American patriots, were sick and tired of having no, um, uh, no representation in government. They wanted, to be, they wanted to be independent, and they had taxation without representation, basically. That's the old, the old um, lingo, right? No taxation without representation. They were ticked. And they mistreated the governors that England would send over all the time because they, they didn't want to be ruled by these people. They had no say in what was going on. And they truly knew, they felt like they really knew what they needed and how they needed to be governed. And so there, there's this tension. That, that's how the story starts, with this central tension. A uh, patriot versus British. The patriots versus the British. And that's, that's, what, that's what young Robin walks into. This is the historic setting. Um, patriots versus royalists, actually, is what you're going to see here. Um, in many ways, one of the themes of the text is hospitality, right? Because Robin's looking for some place to stay. He's looking for some help, and no one wants to help the guy, right? People are very rude to him. It seems that the villains are all over the town, but um, in many ways, what you have here is a rejection of... Um, a rejection of traditional... Roles, a rejection of traditional um, rules of hospitality in some ways. Um, the colonies have been host to the British for many years. And they're sick of it. The British are, quote unquote, unwelcome guests, as Robin finds himself an unwelcome guest. Why is that? Because he's looking for ma his kinsman, Major Molino, who would be perhaps one of those governors that's mentioned in the first seven lines. His kinsman, Major Molino, had, had come into some money and perhaps had risen in the ranks in politics and had, had been able to get himself into a, a political position, which would have required him sidling up next to the British or British governors. And so if that's the case, and as, as we see, that is seems to be the case in the text. The text is, is not really very clear in this many, many ways. It's a very symbolic text. But <coughs> what it seems to me is that Robin is mistreated because of the fact that he's associating himself with Major Molino. Whenever he mentions the Major's name, people are like, mm, get out. Right? They don't want to deal with him. They don't, want, they don't like the mayor, the, the Major. They don't want Robin around because they, just, they despise that type of authority. Um, because the British are unwelcome guests. Um, Robin is an unwelcome guest as well. In many ways, this story by different people through the years has been interpreted as a parable for America's coming of age, a depiction of America's desire for independence from Britain. Now, in a, in a, in a, if you flip this around a little bit, now I've already kind of put Robin in the role of Britain as an unwelcome guest, but I think in some ways, Robin can also be seen as a personification of the American psyche. Now, Hawthorne was, was, was pretty well known as, as one of the early explorers into the human psyche. You see this a lot in House of Seven Gables. Um, so in some ways, building on the rebellious tones of the patriots toward Great Britain, this same sense could be personified in Robin. Robin, by his name, um, Robin as a bird, would 
again, symbolically point us toward flight, right? And as you may know from reading Foster, um, flight is usually equated with what? With a desire for freedom, uh, a desire to escape oppression. And is this what Robin is doing? Is Robin fleeing his own homeland, his, his home, his father and his mother, and coming to the big city? Is he fleeing them? In that way, he can be seen as a type of American independence, <laughs> as a personification of the American psyche that wants to flee the motherland, that wants to flee the fatherland or the father figure and go into independence, to, to fight for himself and to be his own man could be the case. An escape from home in desire for independence. Robin looks to his uncle, Major Molino, not to replace his father, but rather to give him money. <laughs> Robin doesn't want another authority figure. He wants freedom. Robin's desire for freedom is, is pretty explicit, and there's different points in the text where you see his desire for freedom. One of the, one of the th um, areas is on page 9, at least in my text, I have this one, this is Norton. You guys have that or not? But on page nine, <clears throat> we see this is uh, a statement. So saying, the fair and hospitable dame took our hero by the hand, and though the touch was light, and the force was gentleness, and though Robin read in her eyes what he did not hear in her words, yet the slender wasted woman in the scarlet petticoat, scarlet is always, well, it's often used to denote a um, loose morals or perhaps prostitution proved stronger than the athletic country youth. This girl was stronger than him. She had drawn his half-willing footsteps nearly to the threshold when the opening of a door in the neighborhood startled the major's housekeeper and leaving the major's kinsman, she vanished speedily into her own domicile. A heavy yawn preceded the appearance of a man who, like the moonshine of Pyramus and Thisbe, carried a lantern, needlessly aiding his sister luminary in the heavens. As he walked steeply up the street, she tur he turned his broad, dull face on Robin and displayed a long s staff spiked at the end. Home, vagabond. Home, said the watchman. Okay, so one key thing here, perhaps this is Robin trying to explore his own sexual freedoms here with this woman, and he's being stilted by the authority figure. Ah, time and time again, coming up against this authority figure. There, there's something of that there. Um, what also is here is interesting in relation to Pyramus and Thisbe, this, this classic um, couple who is forbidden to be together. And what, what is classic about the, uh, Pyramus and Thisbe is that they are separated by a wall. They are both in different rooms, but separated by a wall, and they put their ears next to the wall, and they communicate through the wall and so forth. Um, but uh, this is a, a great love story, and here we have Robin not in a great love story, but rather just most likely with a woman of... of of, uh, as it seems to say, <clears throat> who may be associated with prostitution. So um, an ironic kind of look at Robin with a prostitute and connecting that with Pyramus and Thisbe. Is this a faded love affair? No, no, not by any means. Is the emotion and the, and the fervor and the, the emotional pitch of a mob, can that be taken as a serious thing? This is a bit of a switch now, all of a sudden, to a different thing. Um, the duplicity of emotions. Now, that, that could be another theme in this text, the idea of the duplicity of emotions. <laughs> Sorry, why my nose over there? Um, <clears throat> in the American Revolution, we see Nathaniel Hawthorne not as an anti-American guy, but as one who is raising questions about the American Revolution and the nature of it. I mentioned before, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne very uh, mistrusting of mobs. Um, and what we see, uh, well, here with the idea of Pyramus and Thisbe, a very serious uh, love affair between two star-struck souls, um, or star-crossed lovers, if you will. Um, and that connection to Robin and a prostitute, um, is this calling into question that which the American patriots were so enamored with. The American patriots were enamored with the idea of freedom and independence. Is this a good bedfellow? Is this someone worth sacrificing everything for? Interesting question. And again, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne raising some difficult questions here, things that perhaps you have not considered. On page 14, 
Um, one of the guys in the, in the in that Robin is talking with says, "May not one man have several voices, Robin, as well as two complexions?" said his friend. Then on page fifteen. A mighty stream of people now emptied into the street and came rolling slowly towards the church. A single horseman wheeled the corner in the midst of them, and close behind him came a band of fearful wind instruments, sending forth a fresher discord, now that no intervening building kept it from the ear. Then a redder light disturbed the moonbeams, and a dense multitude of torches shone along the street, concealing by their glare whatever object they illumined. The single horseman, clad in a military dress and bearing a drawn sword, rode onward as the leader and by his fierce and variegated countenance appeared like, like war personified. Here we go. The red of one cheek was an emblem of fire and sword. The blackness, blackness of the other betokened the mourning which attends them. Duplicity of emotions. We have this idea on page 14. May not one man have several voices and multiple complexions? That's the duplicity of emotions. Uh, having more than one face, more than one voice, being torn in several different directions, um, not having a single-minded focus, not having a, a certain idea of who you are. Here again, one side of the face, um, fire and sword, the other side of the face, betokening a mourning. Um, here Nathaniel Hawthorne again, talking about the American struggle, and perhaps his criticism of mob mentality. Um, all good, did all good accompany the American War of Independence? Or were there, is it more of a complex picture? At what point was the American War of Independence a great move toward freedom? And in what ways was it uh, a manipulation of a mob or um, a dipping into mob mentality? The final laughter from Robin. Has he been caught up in the mob? Why does the man encourage Robin to stay? In some ways, we see his encouragement for Robin to stay as a rejection or an encouragement to reject the British values and in replace, in, 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 to replace them with American, the American value of independence, to cast off dependence on old ways and old relations. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson was, was very famous for writing uh, about an encouragement for Americans not to look to England or to Europe anymore, but to see the, the, their place in this new world, independence requiring confidence and self-sufficiency, and these being the key American values that this man seems to be pushing Robin to embrace. Don't go back home. Continue in your, in your, in your course for independence. Cut yourself off from Molino, from your, from your past. Be an independent patriot like us. Join our cause for independence and freedom. All right, we're going to pause right there.